Hello, everybody, and welcome. My name's Nick Millward from the Mobile Ecosystem Forum. I'm an advisor here at MEF. Um, so SMS and call ID spoofing along, alongside AI-assisted deepfakes pose significant threats to mobile trust, exploiting users through familiar voices. Mobile providers much, must adapt to evolve these fraudulent trends. I'm welcome, I'd like to welcome today Bradley Greer from NetNumber uh, to this webinar, and we'll be discuss, discussing spoofing mechanisms, psychology and communications, and advanced anti-fraud solutions. So welcome, Brad. Thanks for having me, Nick. I'm excited to be here. To all the wonderful meffers out there, hello again. Great. Would you like to just introduce yourself a little bit more, Brad? Just tell us what you do at NetNumber, and, uh, and we'll go from yeah. there. For those of you um, who I haven't gotten the opportunity to met uh, to meet with Meth or worked with yet, hello and welcome. My name is Bradley Greer. I'm our VP of Data Solutions and Product Marketing here at NetNumber. Um, so my um, background is in digital identity for over around the last 18 years. Um, I'm a data guy. So um, what I really do for NetNumber is I work directly with a lot of our clients and figure out how to more intensely integrate our data services to solve problems within their ecosystem. So what happens usually there is, is that we see demands and opportunities from clients all across the world for different types of data that maybe no one has in the system. Well, I work with product to help to build that out and, and and manage that through ecosystems and our services. So I kind of have a hybrid role to where I'm client facing, I'm working with clients to solve their problems, but then I also bring those problems back to the product organization and we figure out how to tackle that together to, to win um, against fraud or against any kind of communication problem you might have requiring phone number intelligence data. Excellent. So. I think everybody's in for a real treat on this one. Uh, really looking forward to the discussion. Um, so just before we start, just to say to everybody, um, in the in the chat section, if you have any questions, please post them in the chat and we'll we'll do our best to answer them as we go through this um, this next kind of 25 minutes or so. Um, if we don't get to them, we'll come back to you um, at the end. But let's start, um, Brad. I think you've got some... Um, some collateral there as well, which we can throw up on the screen. But if you just uh, maybe start with what, what are the most prevalent forms of spoofing attacks impacting the mobile industry today? Yeah, so that's a good question. And allow me to just share my screen here, Nick. And um, yeah, for the, for the audience attending, um, these are just some common slides that I kind of put together. If, if you're a visual learner, it, it might be valuable. Um, these are just common slides that I use, especially with external audience that might not be that aware with spoofing. So um, really what we have here and, and oh, one second. Let me share my screen the correct way. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Nick, are we good? I can see it. I'm seeing the presentation mode, though, I think is a little bit small. Um, apologies. No worries. Why don't we just do this. Why don't we just have PowerPoint open? And there we go. Now we see both of our photos. So, so really to talk through um, types of spoofing. So there's actually a whole entire ecosystem of spoofing, Nick. Um, the green that I've shaded here are communication related. Really everything else is more technical going on behind the scenes and more tactical. But um, we have email spoofing, which most of us probably have seen. We probably even get them in our work emails, right? You see um, emails coming through that you have a virus or any kind of like phishing attack, right? You see all these different emails. But what is a little more um, alarming is we have two categories in, in that impact the mobile ecosystem today. We have 
SMS text, which is also called sender ID. Um, and we have caller ID, right? So when you think it, it sounds exactly like, like what I mean, right? Um, there's text spoofing going on and then there's call spoofing going on. So those are really our two categories that, um, we talk about, um, and I've also highlighted too. Um, I attended an event a couple of weeks ago, and and there are a lot of different types of scams going on using spoofing, and and these are some of them, right? There's tech support scams, there's extortion, there's non-payment, non-delivery schemes, personal data breaches, and all kinds of phishing going on. So really, to dive into SMS and and sender ID and caller ID. Um, really what that means is that means let me just get to my next slide here, team. Sender ID and caller ID spoofing. So sender ID, which is SMS spoofing, is when a fraudster replaces or alters the original mobile phone number of a text message to appear to be someone else, typically embedding it with links, questions, callback numbers, or other reasons to share private information. Um, we see them in North America a lot, Nick, to where it's a fraudster posing as our bank and trying to get our, our payment information, or a um, fraudster posing as a company that wants to write us a check or approve our loan or or something more generic, right? So we see all of these different text messages going on. Um, I was in London a couple of weeks ago. Seems like the whole world seeing um, some form of this. And then we also have the second type of spoofing, which is really color ID. And that's really, um, that's called CLI um, for many of you telco veterans, which is command line interface spoofing. Um, that's when a scammer falsifies the color ID transmitted to disguise their identity, typically with a local phone number or a known, known phone number to increase the chance of a phone call being answered. So what really they're doing is they're replacing that phone number, maybe um, local to your area code to get you to pick up um, that line. Um, sometimes with color ID, they might even plug and play a, a phone number that you might know, right? Um, you might know by way of it being your bank or by way of it being a, a business or, or someone credible that you, you conduct business with. So these are the two types of, of spoofing that really happens. There's one for SMS and there's one for voice. Mm -hmm. So I I, I, uh, I was at an event last week and um, somebody also mentioned another type of, uh, if you like, fraud as well, where somebody will call you from a, looks like a, either a mobile or a you know, legitimate business number, and it hangs up after a few seconds, and then the user will will hit the um, the, the redial or dial back button yeah. to get back to the user, and they hit a premium rate number, uh, yeah. which then charges the the user extortionate amount. So again, is that yeah. I guess that's something you know within the caller ID section as yeah. well. Yeah, exactly. That's definitely like transmitted back. And when you think about the value of that to a fraudster, they now know if you call it back or you text back, they now know your phone number is active and there's a real live person on the other end. So yeah. it becomes very um, problematic. I mean, you know, um, a fraudster is harvesting information all the time and we'll get into various reasons to why, but... Yeah. Work. Just just one quick. Are you seeing this on the increase, or is it kind of flat? Because obviously, you know, sending SMS and, and and calls has has been around for a long time. Is it, you know what what's happening right now? Would you say it, it's on the increase? And the reason why it's on the increase is everyone's data is out there now. Mm -hmm. um, so breach data is more commonly exposed. Um, most of the globe are internet users now, mobile device 
owners. Um, so what's happening is the amount of data that is out there on the web and accessible is just out of control. I mean, everyone requires you to download an app to get a discount now. Everyone requires you to provide your consumer information, right? Mm -hmm. And so what that's done is it's created an aggressive uptick across the world in this this type of activity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I guess less fraud, but I certainly get, personally speaking, a lot of, I guess, calls and, and SMS people trying to sell me things. And I, I do on occasion ask where they've got my number from, and it's never very clear. But maybe that stuff's becoming more, as you're saying, more. They more, probably don't even know anymore, Nick. <laughs> they don't know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's so readily available. So, so, yeah. So, Brad, I mean, how has this evolved over the past few years? Um, in, in yeah. Your, so, so, and let's talk about kind of before and, and the reason why spoofing real, really became a, a communication mechanism is, is spoofing allows, um, you know, some communication service providers to provide messages and alerts and updates um, to their customer base more effectively and efficiently. So spoofing wasn't always, isn't always a, a fraud scenario, right? Mm -hmm. So when you think back in time, there was a time to where this wasn't happening that often. It wasn't a tremendous amount of problem. Yeah, there might be a telemarketer calling you, but there wasn't really a, a common or mainstream knowledge of spoofing. Really, how it's upticked or evolved is fraudsters are smarter. They're using data science models to figure out how to win more revenue from fraud, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're thinking about um, how to connect everything about you together. And really, that's that's how it's evolved over the last two years is, is it's always, it's been a problem for probably about the last decade, but really they're using machine learning and data mm -hmm. science models to try to win. I mean, there was a lot of fraud to where they would never win because they only had one piece of information and they didn't put together you as a persona to convince you to send your money here or to download this app or to put this security on your computer or whatever the case may be. Yeah. Yeah. So, it seems like uh, if we, if we're coming right up to date now, you know, in terms of the AI technologies out there, you yeah. know, they're exponentially um, getting more sophisticated and it seems like what's happening is this is sort of helping us in our daily lives. And it's yeah certainly helping, um, from an entertainment point of view, but it seems to be helping the fraudster as well from what we can see. So, um, yeah. and one component of that component of that is, is deep fakes as well. Yeah. And, you know, from, um, I guess an AI assisted deep fake point of view, how, how are you seeing that kind of evolving in this? Point? Yeah. So, so I mean, really what the deep fakes uh, do is, they for fraudsters they increase credibility or believability right mm -hmm. in, in in different components so like when the spoofing happens a deep fake could actually make you feel like that's a legitimate reason that you really owe that debt that you're paying or that this really is your bank calling you um there's all sorts of 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 technology out there there's uh facial recognition tools that can be manipulated there's i mean there's all sorts of, you know um we 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 can even use ai to create a person with a replicated voice right so there's all these different types of of deep fakes that are transpiring of it. And what it does is it just makes spoofing that much more confusing and believable um, as it pertains to, you know, a, a fraudster's strategy. Yeah, I, I mean, I've personally seen, you know, um, news stories on, you know, let's say slightly older people 
um, being spoofed, you know, through that where they think it's perhaps their, you know, one of their kids or something that are they're asking for money or asking for information, and it does look and sound like them, and they're getting tricked into, you know, uh, giving over information that they shouldn't do, which really brings it home. I think, you know, when your when your parents or grandparents or relatives are, you know, getting put into this situation. So, I mean, let, let's bring it back to sort of mobile and mobile providers. What what what, what can they do? To prevent this what you know that this is an evolving threat and uh, it's becoming really concerning so in your view what what can what can yeah. we do so you know from from a data or verification aspect i mean there needs to be a more rigorous process for knowing your customer right um when i mean for one why can i download an app or buy a spoofing tool online right now, right away, without having much information about me. Why can I do that? There needs to be more information obtained and shared, right, and and verified. Also, documentation of the use cases that it's attended for and some sort of, of monitoring or 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 governing party needs to be involved for that um i really think that that's that's um the future today it's really just knowing your customer today it's knowing uh you know we're a phone number intelligence company it's it's using data like that to identify connectivity to verify operators to know when when um an operator changes on a line type is a huge value add right so there's basically setting up your ecosystem to where anytime there's an activity or an update you have data and you're constantly analyzing that to make sure that whatever it is you're doing is up to date real time and in check with 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 whatever the intended use is. So I will say that, you know, for the communications ecosystem, it's really using real-time data, making sure that people are who they say they are, and making sure that anytime anything happens with the phone number, you're analyzing it and knowing that it, it it's towards what they told you they were going to use it for. Yeah, I think the the key word you used in that for me, but at least anyway, is that verification. There needs to be some mechanism where we can verify um these types of things and you know me personally i believe there is a role that the carriers need to play in this there needs to probably be some overarching rules and regulation around these types of things but i think then it becomes incumbent as the if you like the people that are providing these services and the tech behind it to be able to for us to check or for it to be checked on our on our behalf absolutely um, so let's de- dig a little bit deeper if we can. We don't want to give away too much of their secrets. We don't want to turn our listeners into yeah. fraudsters. <laughs> but could, could you could you just uh, give us a bit more information on, you know, what are the psychological tactics maybe from fraudsters just to yeah. bring us into their minds a little bit more? Yeah, absolutely. So So let's think about it. Okay, so what is a fraudster? A fraudster is doing something to try to make money like everyone else right i use this analogy um is a fraudster is is kind of like a really advanced marketer except the difference is is a fraudster doesn't have all these rules and regulations that have popped up everywhere (laughs) in order to win revenue and deals right so they're operating under a non-regulated environment um when you think about A fraudster, they're thinking just like a marketer. They acquire a list of targets, whether it's on the dark web, whether it's they bought it from another criminal, whatever the way it is, right? And then they're conducting an analysis on those potential targets, okay? Like, what data is missing? What do I know about this person? Where's the money, right? Then they're identifying whatever contact methods they have with the data, right? Um, which was kind of like where those two spoofing categories fell. You know, some of it's email as well. So they're they're identifying how can I engage with this 
poor soul that I'm getting ready to, to um, market to, right? And then they're creating the theme or scheme based on analysis findings. So I'll give you an example of that. So let's say that I get on the dark web and I buy a list of, of breached customers for a specific credit card from five years ago. I'm analyzing that and I'm like, okay, well, what was what was the initial rate and what was the initial um, credit criteria for that portfolio? Oh, okay, cool. So it was a credit repair. So I know these are stressed consumers. Maybe my scheme is to do something credit repair related, right? Or whatever the case may be with whatever the source is. So they develop and create that scheme. They create websites. They create whatever else is required. Um, and then they configure the traps for that specific scheme, right? And then they just start their campaign, whether it's web, email, SMS, or a call, whatever they have, right? They start that scheme and they try to mainstream it as much as possible, right? Um, just like a marketer would try to scale it, play with different things to increase conversion, right? And so really what they're thinking about there is they're thinking about two different triggers. Those triggers are what I call behaviors and events. So behaviors are really activities that are harvested by a person, right? Or in this case, a potential victim. Um, it could be social media posts. It could be uh, you checking in or, or 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 tagging, being tagged in a specific location at a specific time. Could be you using the Wi-Fi on the plane or the Wi-Fi at an airport after you land, right? It could be... Um, saving payment information in a, in a shopping cart, it, you know, and, and, and showing, you know, your favorite retailer. It could be clicking on a social media ad. Um, I've eliminated all that for me as a person, but I mean, a lot of people buy things off of ads, right? Basically, there's all of these end user behaviors of you as a person, and you're going through all of that. Well, a fraudster can sometimes access or harvest those, right? And use those against you later. Then there's the more common attributes like events. People get married, they have children, they buy cars, they move, they travel, they get new jobs, they have paydays. All of those time-based events can create really a, a pretty legitimate story about you and convince you, you know, maybe to click on a on a URL that you're sent from a text message or or respond in a certain way, giving up more information on a phone call. Um, so all of these different triggers happen and really, really the fraudster is thinking about how to psychologically create urgency with you to do something without thinking it through. What's uh, what's pretty scary for me is is a couple of things. What number one is how premeditated this is, yeah. uh, and what's linked to that. The second thing is there is almost a very similar business process to this, like um, a marketeer would use, and uh, you mentioned that yourself earlier. You know that the process you just showed us. Um, as I say, hopefully we've not given people listen to this any ideas for for wannabe uh, fraudsters but you know there is a process a clear process that they must be following to extract um you know money from us or or other other means from us that we you know for, for nefarious or otherwise activities so yeah that's uh, that that's deeply concerning <laughs> but i think it's great that you've highlighted that 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 behavior exists and in order to catch some of this, everyone, you've got to think like a fraudster or or somebody that's spoofing with malicious intent, right? And that's the only way you can really create the operatives and leverage the data that you need to verify those operatives um, through your ecosystem. So that's the most important thing is, is each of you know everything about your user or the phone number that you're working with. And how do you, how do you um, capture 
whatever information there. I mean, you know, there's there's different attacks everywhere and, and each one's different, just like each and every single one of your customers is different. It's really just knowing that and figuring out how to plug and play to make sure everybody's safe. So can you tell us, uh, and this isn't um, a hard pitch, I'm not asking for from net number, but could you tell us some of the things that you're doing to to kind of help um, carriers and operators and, and other companies yeah. with this or, or other, other technologies out there? Absolutely. So um, at, at net number here, really – the way that I approach this is validate, verify, authenticate, and monitor. Like, if a fraudster is coming into your ecosystem, um, they're going to have some sort of validation queue. You're going to have some sort of verification and authentication component. And then because all of this data is being stored, you're monitoring. You've got to be able to distinguish legitimate across illegitimate, right? So. One of the services that we really launched in North America, which is beta, um, a lot of international people, I'm open to having um, exploratory discussions on how we can help you, but um, we've released something called Number Lock. Number Lock through our um, override services registry, which is called the Net Number Services Registry, um, to where we issue Net Number IDs for every single telecommunication provider, we have the ability through that registry to lock down phone numbers now. So it eliminates the ability for anyone to impersonate an enterprise's brand. So let's say you're a communication provider and you work with banks and banks have a problem with, with their phone numbers getting spoofed. <clears throat> we have a way to lock that down to where nobody can transmit communications anymore from our services registry. Um, so number lock will, is, is a powerful tool. Another thing that we've released that's more mainstream is number watch. So what we're looking for there is we're looking for, or we basically allow you to send us all of the phone numbers in your ecosystem and provide you with alerts if, if there's any sort of um, operator or line type changes. Um, again, because spoofing and, and, and fraudsters are interacting um, on time-based material, they're usually going to try to do something with that phone number um, before anything happens. So we have a way to monitor that. Um, then some other most advanced data-driven solutions available today really is, is you know, all of those AI platforms, device scanning, biometrics. So I've been talking a lot of to a lot of them. If you look at my LinkedIn, um, I'm at almost every single identity of it that's mainstream that's happening. Talking to them about um, further monetizing um, phone number intelligence information as a service um, because of the critical role that they're playing and, and making those services more available and mainstream to enterprises and communication ser service providers, everyone in the ecosystem. So advocating for that um, is another way that NetNumber is really contributing. I'm doing a lot of tests and case studies with um, the identity space to try to increase awareness and, 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 and a way to help stop this. Right. So Brad, we've run out of time, unfortunately. I think we could we could go on much longer talking about this. I've uh, personally found this incredibly interesting and insightful. So thank you very much. I uh, just left to say, if you have any questions or have any uh, queries around this and, and want to follow up, please contact the team at Net Number or Brad, and I'm sure they'll be able to help you out. So thanks very much again, Brad, and I'll see thanks you soon. Thanks for having me, Nick. See you soon. Take Cheers. care, everyone.